morning. Uh, this is Houseways and Means. It is May 12th, Thursday, no, Wednesday, Wednesday. And um, yesterday felt like two days to me. And I see that um, Michelle Childs is with us. Um, and she is going to start us off on our next, hi, how are you? Um, on our next um, bill. So I'm going to go ahead and get started on that. That is S25, the cannabis bill. And um, you've been in our committee before. If you can give us, you know, a high level uh, run through on the bill, um, there is a section on fees, which is what, what the bill is in our committee. Yeah. Um, is sure. Where we'll be. Would you like to hear just an overview of everything that's in the bill? I think if you don't mind a sentence on each section or each issue, two sentences okay. or something brief, but yeah, I think it'd be good. Sure. If we, sure. And, um, and can you remind me, do y'all like to see documents up on uh, there or do you like to follow on your own, on your own documents? What's we, your we use it on, on our own devices unless there's, unless it just simply doesn't work, but assume that we got it up on our. Okay. All right. Great. Except on um, those getting mine up. So sure. Go ahead. So I will, I will be quick um, because I know, because it, it's a little lengthy. Um, so I'll just give you a sentence or two on those. Um, and so this is the House Government Operations Committee Amendment to S25, which is a follow-up to Act 164, which you passed last year, uh, establishing the uh, adult use commercial cannabis regulatory system. Um, so section one is simply a, uh, a technical clarification with regard to regulation of uh, by local government. And it's just clarifying um, that uh, when towns vote on retail sales, they're voting on whether or not to allow a cannabis retailer or the retail portion of an integrated licensee. So an integrated license is one where you can do all stages of, of um of, from cultivation through sale. So that's just a technical clarification. Um, section two, um, this has to do with the Cannabis Control Board, uh, the duties, the members. Um, there is one provision in there that's just clarifying that with regard to the removal process by the other board members that the board is to adopt uh, rules under the APA for the, that define the basis and process for removal. Um, again, kind of, I think it more of a technical. Um, there is uh, an amendment to the advisor, a couple amendments to the advisory committee, um, and those are folks who are not part of the, or they're not board members, but they are selected by various appointing authorities, whether it's the speaker or the uh, committee on committees or such. Um, and those folks are, as it sounds, to advise the board on a number of issues. Um, the changes there are um, that they added, the primary changes are that they added uh, two new members to that advisory uh, committee, and that's the chair of the cannabis. Excuse me, Madam Chair. Yeah, I'm sorry, George, no, following along and didn't look. Go ahead. Well, I, I just wonder if Michelle could tell us where she is in the bill. And sure. She, she's just sort of running through, but if she could tell us what section she's in as she's describing something, it might be helpful. I'm, okay. I'm in section two. Oh. It's page page three or four, page three. Yep, and so I'm looking at the addition of two new members uh, to the advisory committee. So that's the chair of the Cannabis for Symptom Relief Oversight Committee or designee uh, and uh, one member appointed by the Vermont Cannabis Trade Association. Those That is the uh, professional organization for the dispensary. So uh, adding two new members to the advisory committee. Um, there's also one change there, which is just bumping out the date for when the advisory committee has to uh, convene. Um, it was originally designated as May 1st. Um, as you know, the Cannabis Control Board was late getting appointed and started. Um, and so that's just bumped out to July 1st for the committee to meet. Section three is just adding advertising fees um, to what goes into the cannabis regulation fund. I'll talk about in a few minutes. Um, there uh, is a new reg uh, regulatory scheme for advertising. So you recall that last year, um, 
there, the, the bill that passed directed the Cannabis Control Board working with the Attorney General's office to come up with a proposal for advertising. And, um, and so that is contained in here. Um, and, and it is essentially the what was voted out of House Government Operations last year, um, but did not make it across the final finish line. Um, the Attorney General's office testified in support of that language. And so that's what's contained in here. And so part of that was an advertising review fee. So anyone who, uh, any licensee that comes before the board, be prior to them being able to publish an advertisement, they have to go before the board and have the advertisement reviewed and approved. The next section is section four, and this is getting more to the heart of, of your area. Um, that is an amendment to section five of Act 164. Section five was a long list of things that the board was to report to the General Assembly on um, primarily by April 1st of this year, but because of the delay in getting the board appointed, obviously they, they weren't able to meet that, um, that deadline. And, um, and so this section, what section four does is it essentially removes the, um, it amends Act 164 with regard to reporting by the board to the legislature for the fees on April 1st. And then I'll show you in section 4A where that law, where that, where that language is, um, what, the, what it's substituting. Um, there's also just a small tweak there that Act 164 had the board reporting by April 1st on uh, resources necessary for implementation of the Act for FY 22 and 23. And that's just been changed to 22 for now. So section 4A is on the top of page seven. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Can I jump in with a question on that? Yeah. So um, is the um, recommendation on resources necessary for implementation for fiscal year 22 uh, been done or does that date need to be pushed out as well? Um, they, I would say it's contained in, in this bill. Um, because there are, uh, they have requested a couple of new positions. Um, funding is not an issue for them with regard to those positions uh, at this point. Um, they said because they have a surplus of money because there was such a late start to the board and the money that was appropriated, they have some extra money in there. So right now they're just looking for uh, approval for two extra positions. Okay. So this bill goes to the Appropriations Committee though. Yes. In terms of an operating budget, I was just trying to, is, is this section calling for an operation operating budget for fiscal 22? Is that what, is that what it's saying? I don't, I don't know. I was just looking the resources necessary for implementation of this act. I'm trying to understand what that is. Is, is that a, a budget request? I don't think it was anything. I don't. I, when you're using certain terms, I don't usually uh, use. I may not be familiar, but I think it was generally to be proposing. You know, do they need additional positions? Do yeah. they? Need, what What do they need to be carrying things out in sure. general over yeah. FY22? Okay. Thank you. Um, so section four A is the top of page seven, and this is what is essentially the alternative to what you had passed last year. So because it was impossible for the board to come to you with recommendation of fees um, during the legislative session, um, assuming that we are adjourning when we're adjourning, um, is the alternative here is that on or before September 1st of this year, the Cannabis Control Board is to provide draft recommendations to the Joint Fiscal Committee for approval on those same fees. So it includes all the fees that were contained in Act 164. So whether it's state fees or local fees, application fleet fees, all of, all of that, it also would include the new fee for um, uh, They're also to be reporting on whether money is expected to be generated by state fees. Um, are sufficient to support the statutory duties of the board or whether or not any portion of the taxes that were established um, need to be allocated um, to the fund to make sure that, the, that they can carry on um, their obligations. Again, that was language that was passed in 164 that's just repeated here. Um, 
So uh, subsection B is that upon, approved, upon uh, receiving the proposal, joint fiscal committee is to review the recommendations and provide feedback to the board for any suggested changes. Um, and then the board is to revise uh, the, the proposal if necessary to incorporate the committee's recommendations and then present a revised draft for approval to the joint fiscal committee. Um, and then notwithstanding 603 and title 32, the fees would take effect upon approval of the committee. And so this is just a one year kind of stopgap measure. And then after that, it would become part of the normal kind of process between the administration and the General Assembly on presentation of fees and then General Assembly approving the fees. So it's just to try to get through this one year because you have uh, applicants being licensed in the spring of 22. And so there's, you know, if you don't have the fees in there, there's a lot of uncertainty leading up to the application process. Um, and so it would just be for this one year. Some things just to note, um, and I consulted with our, uh, our, our attorneys who regularly work on these issues, because it's not typically my field. So I was talking with, with Abby and Becky and Anthea. Um, I modeled this language primarily after what is in Title 22 with regard to the web portal. And there's a process there for that's very similar to this with a joint fiscal committee approving um, fees. Um, and it's, you could also look at like last fall with, with the CRF funds. Um, so it's kind of a similar model where the, when the General Assembly is not able to, then the Joint Fiscal Committee can uh, represent the, uh, the General Assembly in, um, in this. You also have a provision in 32603, um, I don't know, 603 Subdivision 2 that allows for Joint Fiscal Committee to adjust fees uh, when necessary. So uh, we feel as though it's, a, it's a, an allowable uh, use of the Joint Fiscal Committee um, because, and then there's not a separation of powers issue because it's the, still it's the committee approving them rather than the administration set, setting them. Um, I just, for people who are on the committee, when we dealt with the web portal, um, just there's not a lot of us left, I think, from those days, but that was, um, that, that was an issue that was uh, discussed a lot in this committee, not, and not, um, not acceptable to the committee, to this committee, and we eventually ended that process um, of having those fees set other than um, by the legislature. So um, that it, the web portal was a particularly uh, controversial issue um, in here. So, um, so I think I think this is an area that the delegation issue is, and it's I understand that we're not delegating to the executive; we're delegating to a committee of the legislature. Um, but it's a issue that I think bears a little discussion. Uh, Emily. Um, I'm curious, what is the web portal? Um, so, so I, I can tell you the little bit, I don't know if there's any, um, I don't know if Graham was involved with that or not. Um, I, don't, I think it may have predated you. Um, it's basically a, a private uh, for-profit entity that was uh, contracted to um, provide web portal services for a number of state agencies, including motor vehicles and uh, motor vehicles, is sort of one of the more notable ones. And in the, the uh, original agreement with, uh, with them, I can't remember the name of the organization, Vermont something or other, um, but it was a for-profit corporation and um, they had the authority to set fees for access to the portal. Um, so in that set, in that case, they were setting fees for somebody to access this private um, operation. So it was a, a little bit, a little bit different from what we're talking about here. Here we're talking about straight on government service um, and fees that are um, and that uh, would be paid by somebody who wants um, wants then, to thanks. participate. Um, and then my other question is, and I was. Um, 
spared this conversation on ways and means last year, I think, um, when this bill was moving through. So um, curious, I know that the, lots of deadlines have moved, but why um, we don't why we're not starting with just sort of estimated fees that we could correct later. Um, what, if that conversation came up um, when this bill was drafted or when it was in GovOps? Um, sure. So, um, so developing the fees uh, is, you can certainly look to other states for that, um, things like that. But one of the things that to kind of start with and, um, and Graham can, can fill you in on how they start to kind of figure all that out, but is you have to figure out um, what is the appropriate, what's the capacity for Vermont with regard to how much cannabis should be, uh, should be grown and how much should there be in the state. So, and it's, uh, you know, it's an uh, Im imperfect science they are trying to determine that. We had years ago when um, the first, commercial cannabis bills were moving, we had um, a study that had been done by the RAND report that kind of did a lot of that work and kind of, and, but it's, we can't really use that now because at the time there weren't any other states in the Northeast that had legal cannabis markets. And they were anticipating a lot of people coming from other places to purchase in Vermont. Um, but you have to kind of look at, well, what would, you know, how many, how many acres, how much cannabis should be grown? So, and then you divide that up into how much cultivation space, how many harvests and all of that. And you kind of um, use that data to determine how many permits you have, how much is going to be grown. And then you're going to start working with the, the, how many applications and what should the price of those be and kind of tier all of those things. And, um, and so the conversation last year was just that that involved a, a level of expertise and information um, that at the time the General Assembly didn't have. And also because the cannabis market is really changing so quickly, you know, with Massachusetts online and Maine online, and now we've got uh, New York um, coming online shortly. Um, and so the question is, so they thought that the board having the particular expertise would be better able to recommend with more accuracy kind of where those target fees should be um, with and, and kind of balancing, obviously, needing to raise the revenue to run the, uh, the duties of the board because the board is only supported by the fees. There's no tax money that goes to support the board unless you need to kind of backfill it. And then balancing that with making sure that you don't either have um, you know, not enough and you've got lines stretching down the block, you know, for days or whether or not you have too much and you wind up something like Oregon where you've got three years of supply of cannabis sitting in barns, so. Tim. Yeah, um, I think you just answered the question, Michelle, but thank you. Um, you've used the term balance a couple of times and it's at the end of the day, is the, um, is the intention to balance what's grown with in-state need and also from other places to buy here so that somehow or rather, um, not just straight market, but um, through this mechanism, we balance what's grown with what's gonna be used here so we don't end up with a surplus or a uh, deficit, you know, a lack thereof. Right. So how do you how do you try to target um, to have the appropriate amount there to um, to meet demand, but um, not to have an oversupply? And so. and is is the intention that the the fee would um, fees that are applied would help be a, a we're using the term bounce over and over again, but a balancing factor, a mitigating factor to oversupply undersupply. If it costs me too much to get a permit, I won't bother growing the stuff. Um, well, I think the the overall stated goal of 164 many times is is the legislature has said there the a lot of one of the primary goals is to try to move as much of the illegal market into the regulated market. Okay. So I, right. I think it's not so much to keep people out, but it's to try to move the existing market into a regulatory scheme. And so um 
Uh, so I think they're really going to try to balance that. You also have some other priorities in Act 164 around supporting small cultivators. Yep. Um, again, that goes to um, moving the illegal market into the regulated market. And, um, and so, yeah. Well, this is very helpful. And I see Rep Gannon nodding his head up and down, up and down, you know, so, so thank you. This all makes sense. Sure. Should I continue? Yes, please. Okay, um, section 4B uh, is uh, some new reporting requirements uh, for the board for as of uh, for November 1st of this year. Um, and uh, the first one is recommendations as to whether integrated licensees and product manufacturers should be permitted to produce solid concentrate products with greater than 60% THC for purposes of incorporating into other cannabis products that meet the restrictions that you put in place for prohibited products. Um, so you have uh, in Act 164, there are certain prohibited products that are higher uh, THC products. Um, and the question is, is can there be uh, um, certain, the production of certain concentrates that you then incorporate into something that the end product doesn't have that high THC, but it's a uh, but it's essentially um, you know so it's just used as an ingredient. Um, the second one uh, is a recommendation developed in consultation with the Agency of Agriculture as to whether the board should per, uh, permit hemp or CBD to be converted to delta nine THC, and if so, how it should be regulated. Section 4 C is the uh, establishment of two new positions, um, one being a full-time exempt general counsel position and the second one being a full-time classified administrative assistant. And as I mentioned before, um, the board is not requesting any appropriation at this time for those positions. So now the next few sections have to do with advertising. And so I'll just kind of group them together and just to mention, um, so like section five is adding the new definitions for advertising um, and then moving on to uh, section six, which starts on page 15. Um, this is uh, the heart of the advertising section. And um, again, this is the exact language that was passed out of House Government Operations last year and um, was on the floor. Then there was a floor amendment that passed um, banning all advertising. When uh, the bill was in conference, um, the Senate had cons uh, was concerned about constitutionality and the attorney general had uh, issued some kind of had said that they were concerned about the constitutionality of a complete ban. And so what was settled on is to ask the board and the AG to come back to you by April 1st of this year with a proposal um, that met your needs around um, making sure that it's not, you know, marketing to kids, that it's not promoting overconsumption, things like that, that, you're, that they're not essentially kind of um, encouraging and promoting cannabis use, um, but allowing some type of advertising or commercial speech. And so the Attorney General's office, again, because the board was not formed yet, so they couldn't do that collaboration. So the Senate had the Attorney General's office in and then the House Government Operations did as well. And the Attorney General's office um, promoted and supported the adoption of the House Government Operations language from last year. They said that they thought that it was, um, while it was you know, quite strict in, comparison to other, other states, they felt as though it was defensible and they um, did not feel that way about a complete ban. Uh, Emily. Um, the fees connected to the review of advertisements and um, mm -hmm. I can sort of get my head around this for a billboard but we don't have billboards um, or even a newspaper ad. I'm trying to sort of imagine what that process would is, how much this process is described in statute for individual say web ads um, and how a fee would be attached to each of those and 
how much sort of modification of the ad requires a new review and how much of that's being left to the board to figure out. Um, sure, so um, just wanted to mention that um, when you're talking like billboards or uh, newspapers, um, those are completely off the table because yeah provision in here that says that uh, Canvas establishments are not permitted to advertise their products via any medium unless they can show to the board that not more than 15% of the audience is reasonably expected to be under 21 years of age. And so um, there are other states that have it at a 70-30 split. Um, so it's, um, so just so you know, there's not just to be clear with everybody, there's not going to be big roadside signs and, and things like that. Um, there is a provision in subsection E in here um, that, uh, that all advertisements have to be submitted to the board on a form uh, or in a format prescribed by the board prior to dissemination. And then the board basically has a review and can either require a specific disclosure or amendments to the, you know, look, tweaks to the ad, things like that to make sure that it's in, in compliance with the statutory requirements. Also with any rules that are adopted by the board with regard to advertising and marketing. Um, and I think with regard to kind of the back and forth and, you know, we're gonna ask you change it and some resubmit it and things like that. That's not specified in statute. So um, the board may kind of suss that out a little bit in, in rules, um, but, but it's not prescribed to that level about whether, it, I think in general, the way that I've read it is that there's kind of like a one-time fee associated with submitting your, um, your advertisement. But I think it would be for the board. The board will come back to the joint fiscal under this proposal. The board will come back to the joint fiscal committee with recommendations for those fees. So if there was more than one fee upon initial submission, they would indicate that, and it would be up to the joint fiscal committee to approve or disapprove. And I guess my question is: Is it per advertisement that they're seeking approval and paying a fee in the statute, or is it per organization that wants to advertise? Per advertisement. So all each advertisement. Okay. Um, so section seven is just kind of a repeat, and I know y'all hate that stuff, but some committees like it of language uh, with regard to youth. So there's some provisions in the advertising section that um, pertain to uh, to youth, and there's also a youth section in Act 164, um, and this is just kind of cross-referencing that. Section eight is just um, adding something into the rulemaking for the board uh, that they are to be developing rules on advertising and marketing. Section nine is adoption of those same advertising uh, restrictions for dispensaries. So you have the, the adult use in one chapter and dispensaries in another. So this is, but, they, but the advertising um, provisions are, are the same. Section so, 10. I'm okay. sorry, there are, there, uh, there are restrictions currently on dispensaries, am I right? That, uh, is it an outright prohibition? It's an outright prohibition. Um, that has done been done uh, by rule for D through DPS mm -hmm. has always been questionable. I think it's but it's just there's only five dispensaries. Nobody has challenged it. Uh, so this basically changes the rule for 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 everything the dispensary does. Yes. Okay. Section 10 is on cultivation. And so um, the integrated licensees, uh, which are just would be available, there's only potentially five to the existing dispensaries to have an integrated adult use uh, license. They go, uh, they are in, in the queue first for licensing along with small cultivators and testing labs. And so there is a period of time um, for, uh, for arguably up to potentially six months where an integrated licensee may be selling cannabis uh, to the public um, before the retailers come online in the fall. 
And so there's a provision on page 21. Um, what you see is that between August 1st and October 1st, 25% um, of cannabis flowers sold by an integrated licensee is to, uh, to be obtained from a licensed small cultivator if available. So if they are able to purchase um, and then they are required to have 25% of it come from outside. Section 11, um, and so this is starting a few sections on uh, social equity, um, and this one is specifically with regard to fees. Uh, so when the Cannabis Control Board makes their recommendations to the Joint Fiscal Committee um, with recommended fees, they're to propose a plan for either uh, reducing or eliminating license fees for individuals from communities that have historically been disproportionately impacted by cannabis prohibition, or individuals directly and personally impacted by cannabis prohibition. So those terms, those are terms that have, were used in Act 164. I realize that they, people, um, it causes a little consternation from, for folks. Well, you know, who exactly does that mean? That's gonna be up to the board to, to be determining that. So they're gonna, so they would be proposing reduced or eliminated fees for some folks. Section 12 um, is uh, creating a new chapter, chapter 39 for cannabis social equity programs. And essentially this is creating the Cannabis Business Development Fund. Um, and the fund is to be comprised of two things. Um, the first one is gonna be 3% of the gross sales made by integrated licensees prior to October 15th of next year with a maximum contribution of $50,000 per integrated licensee. So, um, so in that time period before the other retailers come on board, um, so the, the, and this would be, this isn't taking money away from any existing pot, it would be on top of. So uh, whatever the, the gross sales are for the dispensary uh, or for the integrated licensee, um, they would take 3% of those gross sales and then they would contribute this business development fund and there would be a, a cap of $50,000 per license. And then the second one would be monies allocated to the general, uh, to the fund by the General Assembly and there is a $500,000 appropriation in the bill for, um, for the fund for FY22. So, so their gross sales um, prior to October 2022, um, am I right that that doesn't include the medical sales that they have? No, it's just the, in, just the integrated license. So it's kind of like if they're going to, the idea being that if they have a kind of a head start on adult use sales, this is you know, they're returning some of those profits and putting them into the Cannabis Business Development Fund. But the, but the dispensary license is a completely different thing. All that money is, but it's the same. I mean, it's the, dispen it's the folks with a dispensary license who are eligible for the integrated license. Am I right about that? Yes. So it's the same It's only, it's only sales of the, it's so only it's, sales made by the integrated that. license for this. Yes. So, um, but it's the same licensee. So we keep all that money separate. And so it's their recreation, their adult use sales prior to October, 2022, which is really gonna be just next summer, next whatever. Yeah, for the period in which they're able to operate before the other ones are on. Yep. When, when, when can they, when can they, what is the date that they can start selling uh, for adult use, the earliest possible date? The earliest date that they could be licensed would be April 1st. So it's the sales between April 1st and October 15th. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm just trying to get a sense of what it is. Yep. Um, so the funds to be used for providing low interest rate loans and grants to social equity applicants to pay for ordinary and necessary expenses to start and operate a licensed cannabis establishment, uh, to pay for outreach that may be provided or targeted to attract and support social equity applicants, to assist with job training and technical assistance for social equity applicants, and to pay for necessary costs incurred in administering the fund. 
Um, it's also a revolving loan fund. So that amounts from loans that are required to be repaid, provide additional funding through the fund. And that gets managed by whom? Um, this is ACCD. So the next section is, so ACCD is to develop um, a program using funds from there uh, for the purpose of providing the financial assistance loans and grants. Um, and let's see, the agency may procure by contract all or part of the necessary underwriting, execution, administration services required. Um, and should the agency be, un be unable to do so, the program shall not move forward until the General Assembly appropriates the operational resources necessary for the agency to do so. Okay. Um, there is a reporting requirement. Uh, the cannabis control. Hand up. Sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Emily. Um, shall the agency be unable to do so? Um, when I first read it, it sounded to me as if that was about they couldn't find sort of the right subcontractor for it. Um, but then the resolution is that we're appropriating resources for it. So I guess I'm. Um, can you explain that a little bit more? I might have to punt that one to uh, represent. Your hand. I was not. I was not in committee for that one testimony. So. So. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. No, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, John Gannon, um, representative from Wilmington, for the record. Um, so, Representative Kornheiser, um, we heard we talked to ACCD and actually took their testimony in committee, which the Senate did not. Um, one of their concerns was, well, they provide grants to a number of different entities through a number of different programs um, that they typically do not provide loans. And so they believed that they needed to outsource that. Um, the problem is outsourcing it is a challenge because cannabis is still illegal at the federal level. And there are many banking issues around um, cannabis. So that is why this language is in here is that while there are at least um, two Vermont banks or credit unions that do provide services to cannabis um, companies, the dispensaries, um, you know, they had not gone far enough to determine whether one or, or more of those could provide those services. And so if they can't, then they would need resources in house um, to provide for, for the loan part of the program. So ACCD would need resources in order to create a whole new loan program internally since there was no way for them to... If they can't outsource it, if, yeah. Because there's no way for them to outsource it. Okay, thank you. That makes more sense to me. So the, the introduction, the, the uh, clause, should the agency be unable to do so, that's referring to contracting. Maybe. I wasn't reading it that way. I wasn't sure what it meant. Yes, that's what it means. Okay. So there is a reporting requirement for the board in consultation with the advisory committee, ACCD, and the executive director of racial equity to report to the General Assembly on or before January 15th of uh, 23, and then biennially after uh, regarding the implementation and application of this particular chapter, including data on the number of applicants, number of recipients, number and amounts of loans and grants, and the identification of continuing barriers to accessing the cannabis market for social equity applicants. Um, and the information is to be presented in a way that they can track it over time. Section 13 is uh, directing the Cannabis Control Board in consultation with the Advisory Committee, ACCD, and Executive Director of Racial Equity to develop crit uh, criteria for social equity applicants for purposes of obtaining the loans and grants. And the board is to provide the criteria to the General Assembly not later than October 15th of this fall. Um, and that one, I will just say, uh, there's a lot of, and I'm sure you'll, you all have in some ways dealt with some of these issues around how to identify um, social equity folks in, in different contexts. And there are a lot of ideas and it got fairly complicated and a lot of different viewpoints. And so they were, so the committees were looking to have um, some recommendations as a starting point. Uh, uh, where uh, were you talking about the 
I got lost. I'm sorry. I was reading. I'm sorry. On just the uh, who is a, who is a social equity applicant. I think um, that's what I was just saying is why it's having these folks kind of work together and then make a recommendation back to the General Assembly is because um, there was a lot of time spent on that in the Senate and they just got kind of stuck. And yeah, I heard I heard all that. I, I was oh, Head to section 14. That's not what you oh. were talking about. I'm sorry. I just I went ahead. I was listening and reading and you have not talked about section 14 yet. Is that right? I have not. Okay. Not that Representative Kornheiser had a hand yeah. up, so I didn't want to move yet. <laughs> that, that's fine. Uh, Emily, go ahead. Um, going back to section 12. Sorry. Um, Curious why, um, what the thinking was on this sort of complicated 3% of gross sales between these particular time periods rather than just a sum of money, such as the $50,000 maximum contribution. Um, Maybe for Rep Gannon, not you. I don't know the original. Uh, folks have been working on it and this is kind of a proposal that came to me. <laughs> I don't know. So that that language, Representative Kornheiser, came from the Senate, um, and we did not take testimony with respect to that. Okay. And then one other question: um, Did you have a conversation about VITA rather than ACCD? Um, yes, Representative Kornheiser, we did with ACCD. We discussed with them, and the the conversation we had about VITA is VITA would not be able to provide <laughs> services. Um, because of the other services they provide, um, because that was um, ACCD's first thought about who to subcontract with, and they determined that that was impossible. Because of the federal rules and the loan programs they currently have? Yes. Good. I got so it. Representative Kornheiser, I, um, I will say, I think that the 3% with the cap of 50,000 per was part of what was recommended by the uh, coalition of racial justice folks. And I think it's an H414 as well. So I think that might, so that doesn't answer like who came up, like why that originally, but it's, it's, that's been the kind of formula that's been out there floating around for a while. Thank you. Sometimes the path is helpful. Um, so section 14, um, so this is for FY22, 500,000 transferred from general fund to the Cannabis Business Development Fund. Um, and then subsection B is then appropriating that money um, from the fund to ACCD to make loans and grants. So now I am a little bit confused, but... Um... So the, the general fund is gonna fund this business development fund and that's the same fund that we were putting the 3% in. Yes, it's the fund is made up of two things, appropriations from the general assembly and as well as the monies from the integrated licensees. And um, if 500,000 is coming from the general fund and there's this additional money, maybe this is a timing question, uh, why is it just 500,000 that's going to ACCD? Because it's gonna have more than that in there, right? It's gonna have 500,000 plus the 3%. Right, um, I don't know, good question. Okay. Um, so, <laughs> so um, I'll have to think about that when it's an appropriations, it's probably, I think that because the, the timing of the other one is October. So I guess there has to be a mechanism for, for transferring that over. So I think, right. I think that's probably a, a gap there that should be addressed. Right. And I get this will probably be an appropriation question, but we do appropriate money to funds. So I don't know that we need to appropriate it to. ACCD and then to the fund. I think we can do it directly to the fund. Um, but that was the that was the way that's that Senate appropriations wanted it. So okay. <laughs> well, on the money stuff, I'm just like, you tell me what you need. <laughs> so okay. Um, 
Um, so section 15, uh, so you recall that last year, so what you have is you have the medical program is currently and has been since its inception in 2004 under uh, the authority of the Department of Public Safety. And so they run the program and, um, and Act 164 has the medical program, the registry, the dispense regulation of dispensaries, everything moving over on March 1st of 2022. Um, what section 15 does is it moves it over to the board two months earlier. So as of January 1st. Um, and so that would include not only the, um, the authority to regulate those programs, it would also be the cannabis registration fee fund um, that exists so that there is this fund where the, the fees that are paid by the dispensaries as well as the annual fees for uh, patients and caregivers all goes into that fund to run that program. It's self-sustaining. There's no money that is allocated from the General Assembly to run that program. So that fund will shift over to the board as well. Um, and as well as the positions and, uh, at, uh, that are, are running the program. And so um, that will be two months earlier. Um, what will happen is that during that time, that brief amount of time, the, the medical program will continue to operate under the existing statutes and their existing rules because the new ones don't take effect until March 1st. Um, and that is what was originally established in Act 164. And because of the delay with the, with the board getting rolling, um, they still have to develop the rules for the medical program. And so you don't want to kind of move that up too early. And so um, they would continue to operate under their existing statutes and rules for, for that interim time. Uh, Emily. The funds being combined or they kept separate but under the purview of the single board? Um, I think that it's going to be, it's, my understanding is it would just shift over and it would be a separate, it would be a separate fund. Okay. Um. Then section 16 is just repealing the language in Act 164 that has it moving over March 1st. Section 16A is the Medical Cannabis Oversight Advisory Panel. So currently there is a, um, uh, a Cannabis for Symptom Relief Oversight Committee that exists in current law uh, for the medical program. Um, Act 164 in repealing the whole statutory scheme and then uh, creating a new one um, took a wit took that that oversight committee out um, and the general so the House Government Op Operations Committee heard some testimony about from folks saying that they thought that there still should be uh, that type of committee um, that's focused entirely on providing uh, medical cannabis to patients. Um, and so, uh, the, but the issue is that the, the current medical statutes are um, fairly restrictive. And so that's why they're generally repealed and, and new ones are coming into play. And they don't necessarily make sense in light of an adult use market. So, you know, an example is um, uh, for uh, medical patients have to make an appointment to go to a dispensary, right? But if under the adult use, you can just walk into any retail store, it doesn't really make sense necessarily that you restrict patients in ways that they wouldn't be if they walked into a retail store. And so, um, and so the idea is to kind of um, reconstitute uh, this oversight committee uh, that better reflects um, the the cannabis landscape now. And so you'll see that um, uh, in the 2020, 2022's legislative session, General Assembly intends to establish the Medical Cannabis Oversight Advisory Panel and request that the Cannabis Control Board submit its recommendations for the membership and duties of the panel to the General Assembly on or before November 1st of this year. So um, the current panel, uh, the current oversight committee um, has, uh, 
a lot of uh, representation by law enforcement. So again, you know, it was originally created uh, uh, quite a while ago when the focus was, there was a big a focus on law enforcement regulation of the medical program before cannabis had been decriminalized and then subsequently legalized here. So looking at and saying, what should this oversight committee look like in the future? Section 17 uh, has to do with highway safety. So uh, there is language in Title 20 that requires um, all law enforcement officers to be to have a, a minimum of 16 hours of training of what's called a ride training. It's advanced roadside impaired driving enforcement training, and they were supposed to have that by December 31st of the end of this year. And that's been changed to December, uh, December 31st in 2026. Next section is section 18. So in Act 164, um, you designated 30% of the excise tax to be going to substance misuse prevention funding. That was in session law. What Section 18 does is it codifies it in Title 32, and it also adds a couple of things, um, noting that, um, that if there's uh, any uh, unexpended monies at the end of the fiscal year, the balance carries forward. Um, and then also that any carry forward um, is to be in, in addition to revenues allocated for some misuse prevention programming, um, not as a substitute. Section 19 repeals that, oh, that session law. Uh, George. Yeah, back in session, section 17, uh, I'm wondering about pushing out the law enforcement training for five years. It's, it seems like an awfully long time that we'll have people on the roads uh, with marijuana. And I, I just wonder what the thinking was of making it that far out. Uh, Representative Gannon, do you want to take a stab at that? Sure. Um, thank you. Um, so part of the thinking here was that um, we talked to the Vermont Criminal Justice Council about their, their A-RIDE training program. And, and what they told us um, is a couple of things. First of all, it costs seventy-five dollars to $100,000 additional money um, to get everybody trained um, by the original date in Act 64. Um, but the bigger issue was they had concerns that by rushing training um, that amount, that that would set up defense counsel to be able to challenge um, convictions um, for um, driving under the influence of drugs. Um, so what, and we're, we're working on a potential amendment to this section, um, but the way that things work currently is if you were, were certified at after 2015, you must take a ride training within 36 months of being certified. So the real question is for law enforcement officers um, who were certified before 2015, because there is no requirement except in Act 164 for them to get a ride training. Um, so it's getting them trained on a consistent basis. And there's actually two steps. You need your DUI certification before you can have your A-RIDE certification. So there can be for some officers, a two-step process to getting A-RIDE training. And so that may take a little longer. Um, so that, that was the thinking. And th there's still the issue is um, that we're discussing with the Vermont Criminal Justice Council is you know, level three officers, which are most law enforcement officers, those are your state troopers, um, and uh, do receive this training, but level two officers, um, which are mostly part-time officers, don't receive this training at all. So we're still working on that. The other issue is there are some level three officers, such as Office of Professional Regulation um, investigators who investigate professional complaints, who probably meet the, um, the roadside testing requirements that you have to be tested on before you can even start a ride training because they don't do roadside stops. Um, so we're trying to figure out how to solve that problem too. Um, John, is there any social equity training involved in, in this training that you require that we require? 
with the a ride training i don't Correct. believe so i do know that there is fair and impartial training that's required for all law enforcement officers but it's not to my knowledge it's not part of the a ride certification process okay, thanks um so did we get to the end of the bill we did okay <laughs> well, good. Um, thank you very much. Um, there are a few, few things that we're going to have to uh, mull over and the fee process is one of them. Uh, Bill. Yeah, thanks, Michelle. <clears throat> Back in Section 4B, you have two new positions with no appropriation. Did I miss where they're going to be paid or covered? So, um when you appropriated money in Act 164 for, for this year, um, there, uh, there was for October through you know, June 30th, um, the board uh, was supposed to be seated uh, by January 19th. I don't remember exactly when they were, but they were about a couple months. Maybe two and a half, three okay. months behind. And so they have funding right now. And they so they said that they the board was not requesting additional funding at this time. Um, I don't know what they've requested in terms of uh, in the future, but right now they said they don't need any additional money. Thank you. Um so uh, thank you, um, uh, Representative Gannon. Thank you for joining us, Michelle. Thank you for your careful walkthrough on the bill. Um, we are going to have to shift gears. We've got, um, uh, I have to go to house education on S13 and um, we have to do a quick review of S47, um, which um, is sometimes known as the Tesla bill. Um, and that bill, uh, the clerk says, needs to be reviewed by us. And I said we would try to squeeze that in this morning. The fiscal impact is negligible, so I don't think we need to take it in. Um, so I want to get that in here. And then we have folks lined up on S79. Um, and then we still have to work at S on S10. So, uh, so I'm going to uh, leave this issue at the moment. Um, and go to S47 if I have the right people here. Sorsha, were you- I, I told them 1015, I can tell them to come over early. Okay, okay. That, actually that'd be great. Why don't, why don't we give people five minutes to walk around and then, um, and then come back at 1015 and do that. And I, honestly, I, I won't be here, but I think it's not gonna take more than uh, five minutes to, well, 10 minutes to go through. Um, so it's in Emily's hands. I see that Anthea just came in. I'm leaving.